and we distinguish them separately. And this equation basically, what it's doing is it's grabbing the initial, the initial mass and dividing it by S squared, giving you quantum mass, and quantum mass in this theory is charge. So do you want to click me again? Now, based on those three equations, plus another uh, equation that uh, I didn't refer to here, I came up with a mapping of all planetoids within the solar system to the, to the charge that it would be at, at a specific velocity near, at, and beyond the speed of light. So all gas giants travel near, not at the speed of light, and they're very close. Uh, one, well, the closest is 1.99 uh, times C, and it equals to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. And that goes the same for all the other planets. Um, they have different velocities, but at those velocities, they would be equal to that charge. So they are electrons. Uh, asteroids, and again, in this hypothesis for photons. So they travel at the speed of light. Uh, and their charge was 10 million times smaller than the elementary charge of an electron. Neutrons were the rock planets, and their charge is an average of about 8.7 times 10 to the negative 24 coulombs or kilograms, depending on what you need to like, decide to use now. So this, uh, th we don't have any basis for the charge of a photon or the charge of a neutron, but based on these calculations, this is the charge values that I've come up with. And the proton, uh, simply put, was a quarter of the sun's mass, because if we are a brilliant atom, then we have four protons. So a quarter of the sun's mass at exactly 2.76 the speed of light is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 uh, coulombs. So we might flip it. Now, later on in 2008, I realized, or 2009, I realized my equations weren't including rotational uh, kinetic energy or rotational velocity. They were just including linear velocity. And I noticed that some calculations were off um, based on ratio between the, the velocity of planets in their solar system and the expected values of expected velocity within the atom that the electrons should be traveling at. So I decided to use um, all movement through space in my equations and derive a net velocity based on the total kinetic energy from rotation and linear. And that is a velocity that I used within a new model, uh, a slightly modified from my initial model. So if you want to click in the screen. And this is the model that came up with, uh, that I derived. It carries the exact same principles as the initial model because I didn't want to deviate from that initial finding that I found. So you'll notice that velocity divided by, um, for, the, for the S function there, velocity divided by an initial velocity. That initial velocity is a function of gravity. Essentially everything throughout space, or everything in space, is in a natural position or a natural velocity due to gravity fields. And that initial velocity is that function. So v, the v um, bracket x, y, and z, position of the object at that position gives you its initial velocity. And both of those are to the power of e. So that gives you the scaling factor. The one below it is a time dilation um, equation. But it's not Einstein's time dilation equation. It is the reverse. Uh, so as an object were to, for the ground object, accelerate to the speed of light, the time passage for this object wouldn't be slower. It would actually be faster. Uh, and that's because of, it was it was simple for me to, to to derive at that conclusion because if electrons travel around the nucleus at almost the speed of light, we know that Neptune isn't traveling around at the center of our solar system at the speed of light, so it must be traveling faster. So time experienced at the atomic scale must be faster, not slower. And you'll notice that the equations, you've got the time dilation equation, uh, or the passage of time, you've got the length transform equation, the density transform equation, and the mass transform equation, and a summary of what the framework actually is. So this is the new relative model. It's still a work in progress. I'm, uh, I'm working by myself, essentially, trying to get this to a better state. But I've been able to map everything so far. Do you like the screen? straight? Now, the results of the relative model also gave me the values to, uh, to the quantum, or well, I was able to map planetoids to their quantum counterparts again. Uh, there was some differences between uh, the outer gas giants and the charges that I was calculating before, which I, I'm going to focus on because they were fascinating, um, which is the next two slides. 
So the analysis for neutrons or the rock planets. Um, <coughs> So here you'll have um, what, what I saw in the numbers and when I was looking at analyzing the, the results. Mars and Venus have the exact same charge. This comes directly out of the equation, which is 8.7 times 10 to the negative 24 coulombs, or kilograms. Right now, the, the, the two units are interchangeable within this framework, which is also the same as the average amongst all inner system planetoids, including the moon. So if you get the average of all these um, planetoids within the inner solar system, and you apply the, the equation to it, they give you a charge at the quantum scale. The average of that of, of those five planetoids, including the moon, is 8.7 times 10 to the negative 24 coulombs. So the, the remarkable thing is that Mars and Venus have that value outside of the, uh, outside of the average. So to my assumption, 8.7 times 10 to the negative 24 coulombs is the actual charge value for a neutron. Now, Earth was interesting because it is actually three times that of the average charge. And Mercury's charge is less than three times that of Earth's moon, which is 81 times smaller than the average charge of 8.7 times 10 to the negative 24. It's negligible. It's not even in the same class as Venus or Mars or Earth. So the conclusion was that Venus and Mars are neutrons. Earth is actually three neutrons, being the bigger of the planets, giving a total of five neutrons, which is a stable early amount, uh, as opposed to a four neutron system, which would be a, oh, sorry, four, four, a nice of four for the early matter, which is unstable. Next two. The analysis of four electrons, sorry. Yes, the analysis for electrons. Uh, Saturn's charge is almost exactly equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Uh, essentially, it was very, very close. Uh, Jupiter's charge was 75% of that of the electron's charge. Jupiter's linear velocity is also 75% of that of uh, the celestial speed of light, which is 17,350 meters per second, the square root of the speed of light. A small change in kinetic net velocity would give it a charge closer to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. In the brilliant atom, and this is where the numbers deviate a little bit, but they're still pretty fascinating. In the brilliant atom, Uranus and Neptune are in the position of valence electrons within, a brilliant, within this brilliant atom. Uranus is exactly 4.9 times the charge of the electron's charge, the elementary charge. Neptune is 15.9 times the electron's charge. 4.9 and 15.9 are both almost whole numbers. And this appears to, do, to have something to do with molecular bonds because 15.9 is exactly the atomic mass of oxygen. So, this is now I'm branching off because I don't know if we're really for sure. Um, could our brilliant system be connected to an oxygen system or some other form of system, some other like molecules, forming a larger molecule? Next thing. Okay, this is, um, I, I title it scale stability, but it's essentially an example of uh, scaling within this framework. So, you'll notice that. Um, the velocity divided by the initial velocity, the power of v, uh, gives you the scale factor within the universe. Um, the key is, is the initial velocity. Uh, initial velocity, right now, for all of us here, I've estimated it to be 849,783 meters per second in the universe in relation to all of our knowledge that we know. That means our velocity on Earth, the Earth's velocity around the sun, the sun's velocity around the uh, solar system, sorry, around the galaxy, uh, the galaxy velocity within this galaxy group and the galaxy group within the universe. This is just an estimate. It could be far greater or far less. Um, but I'm pretty sure that I've seen other papers and they, they've, they've estimated it to be 600 meters per second. This is my estimate. So if you were to accelerate, get into a spaceship and accelerate to 500 meters per second out in space, beyond uh, this initial velocity, your shrinkable factor would be 1.6%. So you would actually shrink by a factor of 1.6% because your initial velocity is already so high. And this is basically an example of scaling within this theory. Uh, I'm going to move on to photons because uh, I, I find photons fascinating within this framework. But mainly because 17,350 17, meters per second is the square root of the speed of light. And to me, I find that fascinating. Uh, as we all know, photons currently have no charge, but in this point where photons are actually asteroids in the asteroid belt at the quantum scale, and all asteroids have mass, so it's assumed that you know, photons must have a charge. 
The key here was to 